We're here and we are live. Okay, so can you all mute yourselves right now while I'm just making the introduction, please? Thanks, ladies. <clears throat> so happy Wednesday, everyone. Uh, we're so happy to have you joining us. Um, I hope that you and your loved ones are doing well during this time. Uh, and I want to say happy, a very, very special happy belated Mother's Day to all the moms, aunties, and guardians joining us today. I'm very fortunate that my, mom, my own mom, Hilda, is joining us on YouTube. Hi, mom. Uh, before I begin, I also want to thank Debo Folaroncho and his team at Society for Africans in the Diaspora for partnering with me to deliver this session to you. If you want to share about this on social media, our handles are in the captions beneath each of our images. And if you have any trouble on LinkedIn, please switch to YouTube. The links are in the comment section. I'm in Liz Ngonzi, and I'm an international educator, speaker, executive coach, and consultant. And I enable social impact leaders and entrepreneurs to increase their impact and reach their potential. We're all facing challenges as today as never before, and we need connection and transformative thinking to keep us all moving forward. On April 1st, I introduced an ongoing series of live broadcasts through LinkedIn Live and now on YouTube live stream that I'm developing to be as helpful and motivational as can be. To do so, I not only draw upon my own 20 plus years of experience, I also invite my extensive global network of experts, like the three women who are joining me today, to share their insights, and of course, invite my audience members to identify the issues that are most of uh, their foremost in their minds. I consider myself to be a Ugandan American, having been born in Uganda, and <clears throat> excuse me, and uh, raised in the U.S. since I was four, year, four years of age. I was fortunate to be surrounded by some incredible and accomplished women growing up, uh, most of, notably my mom. Um, and and I've always been really troubled by the way African women are always portrayed as barefoot, pregnant, with several children, living in a hut, and with no prospects, or you know, seeing the, you know images where the woman is battered, helpless, and you know, the kind of person who needs to be helped by the world. And so, you know, while there definitely are women who are like that, there are also millions of women like the women I grew up around. And of course, my guests were dear friends and African boss ladies making an impact. My favorite proverb, which I adapted slightly, is until the lioness tells the story, the hunter will always be the hero. It inspired me to curate this discussion to help transform how African women are viewed how, and how they view themselves and potentially inspire other underestimated people to take control over how their own narratives are told. The three women I selected were the first names I thought of when developing this concept because I so admire them as leaders, human beings, and mothers, and definitely appreciate them as sisters of mine who are striving to make an impact. I'm gonna have them introduce themselves because I definitely can't do justice to, 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 to them by, if I were to do them myself. But let me share a little bit about how I know them because I think that's important for you to know the context. Um, I first met Amini Kajunju through my cousin, Busi. Hi, Busi, I think you're joining us today. About 15 years ago. Amini, can you believe it's been 15 years? Uh, and it's when Amini had co-founded a nonprofit named um, Angel Africa, which essentially was created to create, to develop linkages between Africans in the diaspora and on the African continent um, and to you know create different opportunities for them to engage. And you know, prior to that, I really wasn't that engaged with the African diaspora, but as a result of meeting folks like Amini, uh, and Vlai Kuruma, uh, Nathan Chumi, and uh, Prosper Urera and others, you know, who are part of this, this Angel Africa network, I became much more actively um, active personally as well as professionally. So thank you to you, Amini, uh, for really introducing me to this new world. In Kem, uh, who is just my fellow sister in tech, <laughs> and I met last fall during the most uh, influential people of African descent awards, or MyPad 100, which every year selects and celebrates 100 influential African people um, and organizations of African descent. We had a real connection in, during the, in the United Nations when we sat next to each other during the official ceremony and realized that we're both tech girls. So we kept just tap, yep, 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 and we've been you know, friends since. Uh, and I just really enjoy um, what she's doing and I really appreciate how she's advancing um, the continent through her, her firm and she'll talk a little bit about that. And um, you know, I, I'm just gonna say that the rest is history here. Now, I have to introduce Barku Tubman. Barku Tubman Zolo and I have been friends. He's actually one of my oldest friends since we were 10. We met at the United Nations International School when we were 10 and became fast friends. And a little known fact is that um, I actually spent the summer with Barku and her sister, Denise. Hi, Denise, how are you? And her mom is Jemima in Liberia in our early teens, right before the Civil War in Liberia. 
And, you know, going to Liberia was a significant experience for me because it was the first time I had been back to Africa after leaving Uganda at age of four. Uh, and that's because we weren't able to return to Uganda until I was 16 because we were going, that Uganda was going through civil war at that time. And so for me, Liberia became a representative of Africa for me. So ladies, thank you so much for joining us. And Amini, I'm gonna ask you to start just telling us a little bit about yourself, your organization, your your path, um, and uh, just you know, show you, share your awesomeness. Thank you, Liz. Thank you, everybody. Um, let me just start and, first. And where, and, where, and where you're from too, sorry. Sure, yeah. yeah. I want to first say thank you, thank you to Liz. I am, I've been so excited about this. I've been so excited about, um, you know, just having this conversation because as you mentioned, um, there's so many, so many stereotypes about African women and, um, and it's, it's just, it's, it's going to be really interesting and awesome for the four of us to engage and show people all the various stories that are weaved into um, what is this beloved continent of ours. And, um, and so I just wanna thank you for the wisdom of putting us together and, and giving us this opportunity to have this conversation. I'm, I'm, I can't even share with you how happy I am. Um, so that's that. But uh, you know, people can read my bio and, and, but I, I, and so that I don't, I don't wanna sort of regurgitate that um, but I want to say three things about me that aren't in the bio that actually um, inform um, the kind of person uh, that I am, you know, my opportunities, my struggle, how I've dealt with um, my career and, 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 and the world. So first, I am the oldest of 15 children. And it's not a story that, you know, my mom and dad, you know, uh, were married for umpteen years and they had 15 kids. No, I am one of 15 children and I'm the oldest and we all have different moms and different dads. And so that information I think is important because it, 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 it has informed how I approach life, how I negotiate, because as you can imagine, that's a very complicated life. I, I, I could write a book about it, right? So that's one. The second thing that isn't in my bio is that I lived in Japan from the age of one to four. And that also, um, my, my, my father um, throughout his life sought education wherever he could get it. And, um, and we, he received a scholarship to study in Japan. And so me, my, my brother, who was, a, who was a baby, and my mom uh, joined um, my, my father in Japan, and we lived there. And that also informs um, my career. I'm, I'm in education. I've been in education for a very long time. Um, I've always thought that education was the greatest equalizer that we have, that in entrepreneurship. And, and, and even that first trip at the age of you know, one, traveling to Japan and having a global perspective has informed um, a lot of who I am today. And then the last thing I'll say is I found myself in Liberia. Liberia has, was, has been just um, critical to who I am today. So we came to the United States. I was a little kid. I got lost here as a, as, a, as a black girl, as an African girl in America. I didn't know if I was coming and going and Liberia grounded me. And so by the time we left Liberia and I came back to the States, I knew who I was as a person. Now Liberia is not my, but my, my birth country. I was born in the Democratic Republic of Congo. But Liberia is, is, is sort of, is like my second mother. And just to wrap it up, um, Liberia is an important part of my life because my father ended up marrying a Liberian woman. So I have Liberian half siblings. So Liberia, the food, the culture, everything is part of who I am every single day. Maybe you're related to Barku. <laughs> <Maybe. laughs> so, 
And, oh. and so, so with that, I'll, 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 you know, I'll leave it there. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Barku. Let's go ahead to Liberia. Oh my so God. Well so Amini, I'm going to tell you that first order of business before I even get to being totally aligned with Liz's agenda here um, <laughs> is we totally must connect post this call. Yes. <laughs> okay. Because I'll, I'll, we'll, we'll, I mean, there's so much similarity. I, I, I am, uh, you know, I am the youngest of six kids, uh, same dad, three mothers. Um, <laughs> I think I'm, I think I'm same dad, four mothers. Right. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, so we'll, we'll get to that. And I think I have an idea of how I know you. So I'll, I'll, I'll get, or, or why your name rings a bell now. Um, so, but yes, Liz, I, I do want to applaud you for the platform. You know, that is, you know, something that is very special to me right now is really being able to connect with like a global tribe of amazing women, because I think that it's really important that we really expand our network, which eventually can expand our net worth. Yeah. Um, and, and, and we can empower and we can empower, uh, you know, the next generation, you know, as well. And um, I have an organization called the Boss Lady Effect that that's really our focus on this global network of professional in inspiring women to empower and encourage uh, next generation. But I, um, I'm Barku Tubman. Uh, I, you know, I am a Liberian girl and, um, you know, grew up in the U S left Liberia in 1980. My grandfather was the, the former president of Liberia. And, um, we came to the U S and, um, lived in New York and I went to United Nations International School. Um, and I think that, <laughs> and I think, you know, going to Eunice was probably the best gift I think my family could have given me. I, I think one is a gift and a curse because it is really not the real world no. um, at all. You, I, I left Eunice and went to boarding school in Princeton, New Jersey and went to college in North Carolina. Trust me, Eunice was, I've never experienced anything other um, ever. So, you know, fast forward, uh, uh, I, I worked in the U.S. entertainment industry for basically 1990s and 2000 and was very privileged to work with some of the top R&B, hip hop artists, Usher, New Edition, um, Donald Jones, Next. Uh, I started, I had companies and, and was able to succeed in a very male dominated industry. Started a company actually called Miss Boss Lady Entertainment. And that's where we, MB, that's what MBL stands for. It's, it's a. Uh, it's short for MBA and Miss Boss can, Lady. Can, when I I, say, when I, can I say yes. something about that? So yes. what I loved about no, I one, I love when you when I first saw that name, but also that's why I wanted I chose this name as um the title for this um se se session is when I was in Liberia with Barku, um her, her mother's driver, Jackson, used to call her, the, her mom um, Miss Boss Lady and had never heard that before. And I was like, what is this? So I remembered it. So when Barku introduced us, I was like, this is awesome. Anyway, yeah, so so that was actually part of why I started the name is because at that point in my life, I had no plans on going back to Liberia. I didn't think I could. I didn't think I would. And I wanted something that would resonate, but I wanted something that, you know, also demanded respect in coming from a male, you know, coming within a male dominated industry. And, um, and so Miss Boss Lady, you know, Liberia, we have a thing that says, put a handle to my name. So you have to be Miss so-and-so, sister so-and-so. And so the Miss came with the Boss Lady and, and here we are. Um, fast forward, I, I mean, I guess I coined myself a serial entrepreneur. Um, you know, I have, I'm founder and CEO of a company called MBL International Group, formerly Miss Boss Lady Entertainment. And, um, you know, I, I believe when people say, what do you do? I, I create experiences and I create experiences through different avenues, through uh, events, public relations, brand architecture and strategy and uh, African market entry. Um, I also am one of the co-executive producers of the Essence Full Circle Festival and also Essence Ventures, uh, lead consultant for Africa. Um, we've opened several businesses in Liberia as well. The Peace Cafe, that's actually going through changes right now because of the pandemic. Um, and, uh, you know, I take pride in, in something that's really special to me is being able to empower the community in which we, our businesses exist in, in, in Liberia. Um, you know, the young girls are very, very important to me. They, they find themselves in a, in a, in a country that sometimes does not provide the opportunity or landscape for the growth and development that they deserve. So whatever we can do to empower them through my boss lady uh, effect is, is something that's very special to me. So, um, and that's, that's, that's pretty much it. I, I'm a mom, 
I think we, we, we got that part and I have three-year-old triplets. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, wow. so we're here, but, um, and they have their, I, they have I, their I, own I, Instagram account. They, yes. Triple they have Joy their own triplets. Instagram, the triple joy <laughs> triplets. And the reason I also like, like doing this and, and, and if you guys can, if you don't mind Liz, um, I also do, I do something every Thursday evening called conversations sure, with boss ladies. Absolutely. Um, and I'm probably going to be tapping into all of you ladies on here at some point It's every Thursday. I really think it's important because I found myself, I needed something to sort of fuel my soul. And, um, you know, we're all stuck at home. We're, we're, we're moms, we're single, we're business women. We're, we, you know, we're just trying to navigate what you know what life is and i wanted to ha have conversations real honest fun engaging conversations where we got to feel like we were in a safe space and connect and um conversations with boss ladies and we get to talk to people who may sometimes be very serious but we tend to bring out i tend to bring out that fun side there's always a glass of wine for me and you know a lot of laughter but a lot of insight a lot of information and so this Thursday, you know, um, we're back on. It's through my my. I, this is IG Live. I'm gonna. I'm learning about all this new amazing technology that eventually I will. I will get on. I'll hire Liz <laughs> <laughs> or and Kim. <laughs> clearly, that's what they do. But I, I am totally aligned with this because I think it is important that we really start to connect more and figure out how we can work together. You know, as a larger group, and that's why actually even working with Essence is amazing, especially on an international level because yeah. Essence has been that to Black women in in a in, in America. And uh, I think we need to be able to do that globally. Another little known fact before I go to NCAM is that I met, I met Richelieu Dennis through Barku when we were in high school. So we know the <laughs> secrets. <laughs> Right. <laughs> or we think we know the secrets. <laughs> we think we okay. We know like the baby secrets. How about that? Right. So <laughs> okay. And Kim, first of all, I want to thank you, Barky, for that. Um, and Kim is a second generation IT lady, IT woman. So I want her to share a little bit about her story, her background, and then we'll just go into it. Thank you, Kim. Thanks, Liz. And you know, like Amini and Barku have said, thank you for putting this together. You know. I know when we first met, we sort of talked about, you know, the African narrative and, you know, sort of how the African narrative needs to be changed as a whole, um, you know, and it's something that's been so important for me, um, you know, when I do any type of speaking engagement, I make sure that people understand where I'm from, um, you know, and, and that there can be intelligent, um, you know, women on the continent that work in fields like technology. Um, you know, so for me, it's, it's, it's a perfect platform. So I was very excited when you, you know, sort of invited me and you know, I'm so happy to meet um, Amini and Barku as well. And, you know, hopefully we can connect after this offline as well. Um, so my name is Nkem Dedemowajibo. And uh, as Liz said, I'm a second generation um, technology professional. So my dad eats, breeds and sleeps technology um, so much that all his three daughters are in technology. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so I mean, we're, we're sort of like the, the outlier um, family that, you know, everybody's like, you all work in tech. I'm like, mm -hmm, yeah, we all work in tech. But then when they meet him, they're like, okay, we get it. This is why you all work in tech, right? Um, so very, very passionate about technology and, you know, sort of what technology can do for the continent. Um, and so I do a lot of sort of like um, technology evangelism, I guess you would call it. Um, you know, just talking to, um, you know, anyone who would listen, really. Um, and this ranges from sort of like policymakers, um, you know, and key decision makers, captains of industry, all the way down to, you know, students who are thinking about in secondary school and thinking about what do I want to, you know, study and what line of, um, what skills do I need to be successful, you know, on the continent. Um, and, you know, I'm very passionate about getting more women into tech because, you know, it does get lonely sometimes. Um, so that's why when I meet people like Liz and, you know, she's like, oh, yeah, she was showing me, uh, you know, pictures of her um, coding squad and different things. And I was just like, oh, my God, you're just like me. Um, so that's always really, really beautiful. And I want more women to sort of have that experience, you know, and I think technology is something that is just absolutely amazing and, you know, especially this you know pandemic i think has shown that it's not going anywhere and that everybody needs these technology skills and digital skills you know so it's something that we have to invest in as a continent as countries across the continent you know so one of the things um I, i'm also passionate about is digital skills development um and so i i my company runs a csr initiative called skill up africa where we go into 
um, you know, homes of less privileged children and, you know, sort of teach the digital skills to them. So we're really sad that we can't do that at the moment because of the pandemic and, you know, the social distancing. But we're sort of trying to figure out how do we, you know, get technology into the home so that we can continue doing what we do. But obviously, you know, the infrastructure problems, internet problems are, you know, real barriers that we're sort of thinking through how do we, um, you know, break those. Um, yeah, so my, I, I think everything I do is sort of focused on, on making impact and, you know, um, and, and leaving a mark in this world and, and, you know, putting the African continent, you know, Nigeria specifically where I'm from on the map. Um, and, and really, you know, being one of the people who actually changes the story that is told, you know, and, and I like the quote that you said, you know, until the lioness tells her story, you know, the hunter is the hero. And that's exactly what it is, right? Um, you know, we don't, as Africans, and especially as African women, we're not telling enough stories, we're not, you know, sort of connecting, and we're not really um, ensuring that our stories are documented, and, and that they sort of are passed on to other women so that you know they can also benefit from those stories learn from those stories grow from those stories so i think it's really really important and technology is the perfect platform to you know sort of just reach a really really large audience and you know be able to share um experiences be able to share a, a path that may not be your normal you know sort of path that you know like the the road that is less traveled basically you know yeah so that's me i think in a nutshell Yay! <laughs> I'm so glad I have all three of you with me. I think I definitely made the right choice. Um, I wanted just before we go into it, I really want to I want to welcome some of the folks who are joining us today. Um, Deba Fularancho, um, who he's you can see him right here. He says, "Thanks, ladies. Your participation means a great deal." Debo is the the founder. Actually, he's the founder of Applause Africa magazine, which you know came out you know about, probably about a decade ago you could at that time bought, purchase it in Barnes and Noble but I don't think they're Barnes and Noble bookstores anymore in the US um, and he um, has subsequently uh, founded Society for Africans in Diaspora but I've got to applaud him because one he is um, our he, he is our partner in this he created his team created all the graphics for this event and he helped us push to promote this and get the word out. But what I really, really applaud um, Debo about is he definitely celebrates Africans. He definitely celebrates the African diaspora and creates platforms and opportunities for us to shine and to be able to engage. So I wanna recognize him for all that he does and for being part of us. And I also wanna recognize Camille, um, Camille is actually joining us right now. Um, um, Ophobi, who who's actually the founder of MyPad 100, or most influential people of African descent, and he's also someone who actually brought um, you know and Cam and I together, um, but also um, has created a platform through his his brand and his organization to celebrate those of African descent who are making a significant impact. And I'm talking about people like I didn't know there were Africans in Pakistan, but we met one woman who was celebrated. She's actually a member of parliament there. So we're everywhere and we're really having to figure out how to connect together. Let me say hello to some other folks who are joining us on YouTube. So we've got Kelly Nascimento De Luca, who is ours. She's part of our squad. She went to Eunice with us. Um, and Kelly is an amazing filmmaker. Please follow her on, on IG and everywhere in the world. She also happens to be Pele's eldest daughter. So she knows a thing or two about soccer and sports and she's doing a great documentary on women warriors women who are incredible athletes around the world and being able to demonstrate their leadership through it um, i also want to recognize dr ruth brown who is the ceo of of the ronald mcdonald house of, of new york she's an incredible incredible leader i met her last year in new york when she was being honored by the women in development so certainly check out what they're doing um they are when, when families are going through the roughest period because their kids are, are, are sick, her organization is the one that provides them with housing, provides them with care and love and so on and support while they're going through that. Also when I recognize Catherine Ngatich, who I met in, in, in Kenya, who is uh, working in the social sector in Kenya in December. Of course, uh, my friend Seiko Lanyadiero, who's also um, known as uh, Nixon, he is the, He's, he's the head of the NGO coordination board in Kenya. And so he really um, is helping to advance the NGO sector there. And I'm going to hopefully be having him on soon. Um, I want to recognize Nadia, Gar Nadia Garfunkel. Um, hi, nice to see you. Um, and then 
who want to recognize Sapiso Mwange. Um, and then Woody Collins, who is like one of my diehard, he's always with us. Um, and in Amini, I want to let you know, he's excited to hear from you because he, even though he's based in the Midwest, he, um, he runs an NGO in, in, the, in the DRC. Can I ask you, Amini, to mute yourself? Because I think I'm getting feedback. Um, and so he's interested in, um, he's intrigued about IUGB and your partnership in uh, with GA, I guess with Ghana. Um, several nonprofits here in Indiana are are beginning partnership talks. He wants to hear more about that, okay? On LinkedIn, because I got to do LinkedIn my phone. That's the only way we can make this happen. We've got um, Gladys and Daigre. Hi, I, 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 Gladys is my girl from Uganda. How are you? Um, and then you've got uh, Thembi, Thembi Madachi. Um, we've got Marishan, who's Libahang from uh, South Africa. We've got Charity Wanjiku. Hi, Charity from Kenya. She's one of my students at eCornell, the eCornell program. G. Kofi Annan, who's a great friend of ours. I mean, you know him. Camille is here. Um, Simon Scriver, who is a scriber, who's a great um, leader in the uh, social impact sector in the UK. And then Glenwood Ross. Uh, thank you for joining us. And let's see if I have any questions. Um, oh, Liz Grossman. I had Liz Grossman on um, earlier this last month. Uh, she runs Bob Bob Consulting, uh, an organization that does a lot of communications work around the continent. So, hey, hey, Liz, how are you? And um, all right, so let's go ahead with our first question that I want to ask. Um, and I think maybe what we'll do is maybe Mimi can take this first, or you, you decide how you want to go. So I think everyone wants to talk. Uh, and you sort of touch upon this a little bit, but I want to make sure that I definitely go into it. Um, you know. You know, I've, I've, let me, sorry, okay, <laughs> sorry, I'm going to get right here, okay. Um, in today's cl business climate, and particularly in Africa, businesses can no longer be profit-driven. They also need to demonstrate that they're investing in communities where they operate, um, or in other words, how they're, how they're doing well, well, how they're doing good while doing well. Um, and so I'd like to really hear from you about, you know, how your organization, organizations that you've worked with, um, are really good corporate citizens is really what it is, and and you as a leader, um, how you're demonstrating that. So if you want to go ahead and start, whoever feels like they want to start with that, that question, I appreciate going. Meaning, go ahead. Um, so I've I have to tell you that you know um, when I worked at Weibo and and helped um, to develop thousands of entrepreneurs along with an amazing group of um, st staff members and volunteers who were mentors to these entrepreneurs. Um, when I started my own business here in Brooklyn and, and my husband and I ran a, a, a cafe for two years. Um, and then when I think about all the, the businesses that I've interacted with that I'm that I'm that I think are, are good businesses, there isn't a difference between, when, when I think of these businesses, I think of these businesses doing good and doing well all at the same time. It's, it's, it's not separate. And let me, let, me, let me be specific about that. So one, um, individuals go into a business and they work there or they're, they're a customer there and that business is providing a product or service to the individual. The staff is there producing the product or service and they're getting paid for it. When you are a business that is well run and, and, and your, your value are in line with being good while doing well, you pay decently. You pay as the best, the, you, 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 you pay well. And, 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 you know, and where, you know, they say where much is, is given, much is expected. If you're doing well, you're showing that um, and you, you're, you're transferring that to your staff. That's a business that, 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 that is mixed, that, 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 that may not even need a foundation on the side, you know, to do the good because they're doing good every day, right? I, I and I'll, I'll I'll bring it down. We when we ran the coffee shop, we weren't the best paid coffee shop on the block. I'm sure there were others who paid them well, better than us, I'll say. But in addition to pay, and and, and statistics have been done about this, a lot of employees they may take a lesser pay for being treated with dignity. 
I've seen that over and over again. They may take, um, you know, they, 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 they are focused on being treated with the respect, being the, it's communicated to them that they matter, whether they're washing the dishes or whether they're the chef, no matter where they are on that value chain, they are treated with respect. And I think um, companies that understand that are, do much better and are, are able to hold on to employees a lot longer. We are employees. We, we were always shocked because consultants will come into our cafe and say, your employees actually look happy or you've had this person for eight months. That never happens in the restaurant business. People, it's a quick, it's a lot of turnover. And, and when they asked our employees, it was attributed to how we were treating them. They, and, and in fact, there were months when we weren't being profitable, but we still showed up so that we can pay them. So, um, so I think I, I think those are some of those are some of the um, elements of a business doing good while doing well. Because of COVID nineteen, we've had such difficult economic disruption, and sadly, and I'm hoping it can end tomorrow. But the experts are telling us that this can go on for a while, which is heartbreaking to me. That is just heartbreaking to me. So now you're a business. Is that the time? that you show your colors? Is that the time where you, you show who you really are as a business? What sacrifices are you willing to make to make sure that your customers and your staff, the people who work with you to make the business run, what sacrifices are you able to make? I'm hearing, and we can talk about this later, but I'm hearing of some really good examples of businesses really stepping up and then I'm hearing of businesses who aren't stepping up. I don't want to name names, <laughs> but, but, but this is really an interesting opportunity. And then the last thing I'll say is when you're running a business, there's so much, so much that you can't always control. We did not, you know, this pandemic came upon us. And sadly, there are going to be businesses that are going to go out of business to no fault of their own, to no fault of their own. And, and that's going to be heartbreaking. And we, as a society, as a government, as an economy, we wanna make sure we minimize that. I, I agree 100% with you. I, I wanna share, thank you for sharing that. I wanna, um, last week I had folks on from Candid and they, they were sharing some statistics around um, social impact sector around the world. And what they found was that a fifth the, of the community-based organizations that they interviewed around the world, 50% of them are 30, 90 days out from completely shuttering. Think about that, 50%. Um, so, so that's a really, really scary to think about. And I mean, you both spoke about the private sector, but that's, you know, those are people who are taking care of people, you know? Um, uh, and Cam, do you wanna, do you wanna jump in? Yes, sure. Um, so I think, I think it's really about, you know, sort of figuring out like what kind of organization do you want to be? Um, and for me, it has always been investing in people and, you know, making sure that if you come into my organization and you work with me when you leave, regardless of when that is, you will be a better person um, in terms of the skills that you have, in terms of, you know, um, whether it's actual technology skills or it's just like communication skills, critical thinking skills. So, you know, we invest a lot in, in training um, and, you know, sort of my, my, my team always laugh at me. They're like, yeah, you know, your method of teaching is it's a bit strange. And I say, yeah, well, I'll teach, I'll throw you into the deep end of the pool and you'll figure out how to swim. But guess what? I will always stand next to the pool and, you know, make sure that you don't drown. So you will be given opportunities that are much bigger than the knowledge that you have, as long as I can see the potential. Um, and, and that means that you will learn much faster. So I'm actually helping you to accelerate your learning, you know. Um, and and this has actually, in my experience, been has proven really really useful. Um, you know, and I've seen you know people come in with zero skills, and three months later, you know, they're handling their own client accounts and they're doing amazing stuff. And you know, when they then see that they can do it, they also 
you know, gain a lot of confidence and, you know, they're able to do even more and then also want to do more because there's the hunger there, you know. Um, I think also making sure that there's exciting work for people to do. I think that's really, really key, um, you know, and, and also figuring out, you know, what do you want to do as an organization, you know? So for me, giving back has always been a big part um, and, and giving back in terms of knowledge, right? Because I think that there's no knowledge that is not power. And in my mind, education and knowledge are the only things that nobody can really take from you, right? I always say, tell people they can steal everything else, but what's in your head um, until they, you know, have one of those devices that they have in the sci-fi movies <laughs> where they erase your mind, it's yours, right? And that knowledge that you have there is what's going to take you to the next level. You know, so we've, you know, through our um, CSR initiative, Skill Up Africa, we've basically created ways for our team and our, you know, um, to also go and give back and share the knowledge that they have. Um, another thing that we've started doing, um, you know, which we sort of had planned as, as part of our um, strategy for this year, but, you know, COVID sort of accelerated everything was to share, um, you know, we, so we do in-house trainings every two weeks where every team member has to train the rest of the team on something. Um, and we decided that we should start sharing those trainings um, with our clients and, and whoever wants access to them. And, you know, so, so when the pandemic came, you know, a lot of people started talking about tech and I started getting calls like, how do you set up Zoom? How do I do this? And I'm like, OK, maybe we just need to release all of this training. So that's one of the things that we did to support our clients, to support people out there who are, you know, sort of like struggling with technology and struggling to understand, you know, all the things that they need to be really looking at. Um, and, and I think for for me, that's really, really important. And, you know, for our clients, we've also you know, the minute that we sort of knew that there was a lockdown looming, the first thing that I did was to sort of call my accountant, how long can we run without income? Because um, it's not about, you know, I always tell my team, I'm like, I don't pay you, our clients pay you, but it goes deeper than that, right? Because they can only pay us if they get income. So who is your client's client? Right. And that was something that, you know, I started looking at and I started realizing that my clients, clients will not be able to patronize them, which means they won't be able to patronize me. But I have retainers with these people. So I said, OK, you know what, we'll keep running. Don't worry about the payment. We'll figure it out. Right. But as a business, that also meant figure out how you're going to get some other cash from somewhere. Um, you know, so so we also um, you know launched a lot of new services um, and started doing things very differently to what we had initially planned in order to be able to sort of retain, you know, the clients that we have and making and doing our own part to making sure that their businesses stay alive because, you know, the statistics are so crazy and, and, and scary. And, you know, I, I just feel like it's, it's everybody's duty to help everyone um, get through this time, um, you know, whether you're doing it um, by, you know, maybe donating money or whether you're doing it by sharing knowledge or you're doing it by giving discounted or free services or, or you're giving, you know, stuff away that, you know, you don't necessarily need or that is useful to other people. So I think this is really a time where every single business has the opportunity to do good, um, you know, and hopefully that will then in turn lead to them doing well, because I think that when you do good, you know, um, that's also what, you know, in, so I'm half German and in Germany there's a saying that the way you shout into the forest is the way it echoes back. So, you know, I, I'm, I'm one of those people that really believes that, you know, when you give and when you, um, you know, show love and, 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 and help other people that, you know, when you are in need, you will receive that help um, right back. You know, so I think this is the perfect time for businesses to actually start thinking about how they can impact their customers, how they can impact their teams. Um, you know, and, and not necessarily think about, okay, how do I survive as the business owner, right? Or how does the business survive? I think that when you start working together with all the different stakeholders, you will find ways for you to survive because they will see you're looking out for them and then they'll look out for you as well. I 100% agree with you. I think that now is the time of Ubuntu. If some of you have heard of that, that term Ubuntu, uh, which is a Bantu term, an African term, uh, which really signifies, you know, I am because we are, right? So we're all interconnected. And I think this, if I think one good thing that comes out of this pandemic is the knowledge that we are all interconnected. We, we have to work together to get through this, whether it's, you know, health-wise or economically and so on and so forth. So I couldn't agree with you more. 
Before I go ahead and let Park Hu speak, I want to acknowledge one person who just joined us, and that's um, Ambassador Atala Shabazz, who is Malcolm X's oldest daughter. She's also a fellow of Yunus alum, so I just wanted to say, she said a shout out to you, Park Hu. Go ahead. You're muted. I, I, I um, you know, I, I, I got so engrossed in both of you ladies and your responses and, um, and appreciate for all that you do. I, you know, I've always approached entrepreneurship from when I left the U S and started, you know, transitioning to doing more business in Liberia from a social standpoint. Um, I have to say when I was here working in the U S entertainment industry, I was probably a very selfish entrepreneur. I, I, you know, you, I think living in America, you don't, you're not forced to see, uh, poverty. You're not forced to see, you know, what happens. It's not in your face, you know, in, in, in that way. You can actually shelter yourself from it. As I started to spend more time in Liberia, I realized that uh, there's a level of responsibility that must come with being an entrepreneur and a business owner in, you know, in that part of the world and in, in, in certain countries. And so, you know, my husband sometimes would even get annoyed with me. I would intentionally position my business to provide something that sometimes may not have even been a part of our business model. Like, so with the cafe, I realized people that were making Liberian um, art, artifacts, arts and crafts, they had written writers, they had nowhere to sell their, 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 um, their goods. So I was like, okay, I'm going to create a stand. Everybody knows that they can get it here. The Liberian artists had nowhere to show. I started an unplugged series where they could perform and share their talents. Um, and so, you know, for me, it's always, making sure that the community, you know, benefits from what we're doing. Um, you know, I was even very intentional about where I got my produce, how many, where as often as I could, could I go to get my goods from market women um, as much as possible? I don't care if it was 10 of them that I had to put together to get the quantity that I need, but you know, it was, it was one of those things. And so as you grow in this market and as you grow as a business person and you understand the level of responsibility that comes with it, you know, I developed a, a motto that, that sort of guides everything right now for me, even down to the clients that I agree to work with. Um, and it's purpose, impact and results, you know, and those, those three things guides everything that I do. Um, you know, my clients now, I have to say, you know, interestingly enough, there are entrepreneurs who they're, they're just not, you know, they, they don't think of community, but what has happened in, in the fight of coronavirus and, you know, COVID-19 in Liberia is before government could sort of get together and understand and how to rally uh, any type of response, the private sector really got together. I'm in many women's group and we started donating. We started to take responsibility for quarantine centers. Uh, there's so much else happening right now with pregnant women. And I mean, there's just so much that every private sector, and of course the private sector then goes into, you know, Af living in Africa and doing business in Africa goes into, well, you guys are not providing the, the environment for us to succeed, but we know we have to be responsible. And, you know, I mean, to your point, you have people that work for you. The people that work for you have responsibilities. One person that is in your employ in a country like Liberia is more than likely responsible for about eight to 10 people. Um, you know, depending on their level of, 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 of regardless of where they are. So I, I feel like, and then, you know, having an opportunity to work with and, and, and have a relationship and, uh, and a, and a friend, like, and a brother like Rich Lou Dennis, who built his business off of what they call community commerce. Um, so even as we did Essence Full Circle Festival, and if you look at, you know, the growth and in, 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 in direction, I think they're going in, there's a lot of intentionality in making sure community benefits from everything that they do and with the new voices funds. And, and so, you know, I take a, a page out of that book in, in terms of, uh, making sure that we're very mindful with our clients, you know, who uh, in Liberia, um, a lot of what we're doing with them is saying, listen, in fact, I actually created a CSR program for a client because of COVID-19. I said, what are you going to do? You know, you have to do something. And they're like, what are we going to do? So we created green communities. And so I said, we're going to keep it simple. We'll take the community that your business is in and we're going to make sure if they're going to stay home because we know they can't afford to stay home, they live from hand to mouth anyway, we're going to feed them. We're going to make sure they have the basic necessity and provisions to at least give them 21 days, you know, uh, to stay home while things are being managed. So I think, 
your approach has to come with a level of responsibility. I, I believe everything has to have a purpose. There must be impact. And with that, then yes, you will get the results that you're looking for. And I think we'll all grow out of this time. And those will be the businesses that are standing. And those will be the businesses that are respected. And those will be the businesses that people want to continue to partner with because um, they know that those are businesses they can count on when things are not going well. Wow. See, see what, what these are like some serious boss ladies <laughs> with a heart, huge hearts. Um, I want to just go ahead and we have some people who have some questions. I'm going to just show Dr. Brown's question here. Um, she, she wants to know a little bit. She wants you to comment on social impact investing for shared Afro-descendant women's agenda in this new environment, which I think Barku, you might be able to speak to with even, you know, what you're working Social on impact this. investing for a shared Afro-descendant women's agenda in this new... Can we all come together and invest? Can in we all others? come yes. together? And I, I mean, I think, I think, you know, right now the investment is really the, the, the knowledge, the knowledge sharing. I think people need access to information. And I think um, there are platforms like this, but there's even more uh, uh, platforms that actually are sharing ways to access. I think one of the things that we're missing a lot of times that I'm even finding now is we don't have information. You know, we really don't have the information to get, keep ourselves going, to get together. Um, you know, in terms of a, a larger women's agenda, we have us now and then we have the next generation. So I'm not, you know, I think one of the things that we have to be intentional about making sure we get together like we are now, but also it's really, really, really important. It's so funny that you even brought this up is because I was thinking even prior to this is like, you know, our girls in Liberia are once again out of school. Yeah. They're once again out of school. So what do we do to make sure? And, and I mean, in the past 12 years to now, you know, kudos to Madam Sir Lee, in, in sustaining that, maintaining that peace, there's not been an interruption in school. Now there's interruption in school because of the pandemic. Um, many of them have no access. I think, uh, uh, and Kim, you talked about it to internet, um, you know, and how do we make sure, so whereas, you know, schools or private schools have access to online courses and things like that. So basically they have nothing. I think we need to be mindful and be strategic in how to make sure we invest in them even more. Um, go out of go out of our ways to be able to 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 help them, but I think we we're going to need to work together because uh, you know offline I'm gonna, I want to talk to you and Kim about this technology you know skills development and how we make sure that they have access to it and they can get you know out of out of when this is all over how do we get on the playing field with um, with all of that, but um, I think on a social impact investing for shared that's such a deep question afro decent women hey. agendas <laughs> like the root brown boy but i i think right now it's there really about in, 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 in investing and in creating access to resources i think that's really our best way of doing that at this moment um and we need to be mindful that everybody is coming to the table at different levels and how do we meet everybody where they are yeah so she just said something in response to she says i totally agree on the focus on knowledge investment. So she agreed with you. That's a that's a big one for me because you know I mean that question. <laughs> that question. That was like an SAT question. <laughs> it was an SAT question, but I'm glad to know that I passed. But I, I, I you know it's it's something that I think I I I've sort of heard, um, you know, consistently from all of the women on here is the importance of making sure that we empower through education and skills and you know and knowledge because we don't you know. We're all yeah. prior to getting on this call, interestingly enough, you know, which was really cool, Liz, for making sure that, you know, we work out all the, the technical glitches, but just really get to connect is just, you know, learning all of the new things that we had no idea about on different ways to connect in terms of Zoom calls or, you know, different platforms. So I, I definitely, you know, hope that we all work together in some way or individually to impact, you know, especially the next generation. Absolutely. Does anyone else want to answer this one, or should I go to the next one? Can I? Can I just? Can I just add? Um, hi. Can you hear me? Yeah. Can I just add one more thing? And th and this is um, this is a bit to the investment piece, but um, I, I I've been thinking a lot about um, the fundamentals, and I've been thinking a lot about the fundamentals, particularly. And I you know I hate to bring up the G word, but you know from, from governments. Um, <laughs> um, 
I've been thinking about the big five. And, you know, if you go to my Twitter, this has not caught on and I'm going to keep pushing until it, it catches on. When you think about the big five, if you're from East Africa, you think about the animals, right? The, the big five animals that you can see when you go on a safari. Yeah. But when I think about the, and I, and, I, and I like that and that's cool, but the big five to me, um, particularly COVID, I think is just right, is just really taking this to the top. The big five fundamental investments that governments um, and others have to make on the continent in order for us to really get through challenges like this are the following. Education, health, energy, infrastructure, and water. To me, those are the big five. African governments and all those who work with them have to focus on these five key things. Because right now we're seeing in, in this pandemic, the lack of these five things is, is, is not only creating more um, pain than there already is, but if, 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 if this goes on, the pain is going to be prolonged. So I'm hoping that one of the lessons learned as we come out of this is for us to redirect our energy into these five things. And education being where you know I sit, talking about girls and boys being out of school. I think last time I saw there's there, um, there are about 196 countries whose schools are closed. 250 million African children are at home. It's a serious problem. So, so in terms of investments, and I know these are big topics, but we got to invest in these five things. Okay, thank you. And Kim, do you have anything or can I go ahead? Because Kelly has a long, another SAT question. <laughs> okay, I'll attempt Kelly's other SAT okay, question. Let's look, let's look at Kelly. So Kelly <laughs> says, look at oh, her little cute son. Um, one of the things that inspires me always, but especially now is the prospect of change. What do you ladies see as significant positive changes that may emerge from this unprecedented time, which ties in, let me tie it in with a question I was going to ask, which is how have you adapted to COVID-19 in terms of like going digital and anything else that you're doing in your, in your respective organizations or even personally? Go ahead. So I think, I, I, you know, I think that um, COVID-19 is, is like a diagnostic tool, right? It has shown up all the gaps um, and all the areas that we need to invest in. It has shown in all the areas that, you know, where things are not working, right? Um, and, and, and I think in Africa, especially the problems, you know, um, like Amini mentioned, are very different than anywhere else in the world, right? So in Nigeria, for example, the lockdown was lifted because people were hungry and people were, you know, um, going on the streets and saying, you know what, let COVID kill me, but hunger is not going to be the cause of my death, right? Um, so I think that really in terms of, you know, sort of positive change that we're going to see that will come out of this, I think will be those investments into those big five that Amini is talking about, because now government are, is seeing that, okay, we don't have the facilities, right? And together with the private sector. So, I mean, in Nigeria, what has happened is that the private sector has really donated a lot of money, a lot of resources, um, you know, and, and and also in kind donated services um, and, and things like that to ensuring that healthcare can be delivered, for example. So some of the telco providers have donated data, have donated yeah. um, phones and devices for telemedicine, right? We've seen, um, you know, a, a bank in Nigeria that, set up a uh, an, an isolation center with 100 beds right these are all you know positive changes where we're seeing the private sector and government collaborate on a level that we've not really seen before and heavily investing in key areas another bank in nigeria also invested in e-learning and you know trying to and i think they're reaching about 5000 children in lagos state to make sure that these children have the possibility to actually go online and learn, you know, so that there are, you know, that they reduce the number of the children that are out of school and reduce the gap that is, you know, that is currently happening, right? Because the private schools are, you know, still in session, they are still running um, their classes, um, but the public schools are not. So we're widening sort of the gap to, to our, within our societies, and we're widening the gap globally as well 
in terms of you know just kids not having access to education so I also think that it has shown, you know, the gaps that we have with technology. And this is for me the most exciting part because I think we will finally um, wake up and start thinking about policy. And I've seen a lot happening in this space. I'm involved in a couple of policy um, groups in Nigeria and all of them have been working together with government to think about what type of policy do we need to um, change and to include in, in our legislation to ensure that we have we are ready for the fourth industrial revolution, that we can truly become a digital economy. So I think that we're going to see a lot of change in, in on that on that digital transformation um, plane. And I think that we're going to you know really see technology play an even bigger role in the way that we engage um, with government, that we engage with um, customers for businesses, um, and that we engage, you know, even with each other, because that is so currently the only way. And in order for that to be possible, we need infrastructure, right? So I think that we're going to see heavy investments in the infrastructure sector. Even though economies are, um, you know, really, really suffering, and Nigeria, especially with the, you know, um, fall of the um, oil price as well, you know, we've sort of been like punched in the face and punched in the gut all at the same time. Um, but I think that what we will realize through that is that we must reset. We cannot continue with the status quo and we have to use technology as a core driver of our strategy of how we're going to really get to that next level that we're looking for, right? And I think that technology will be the core driver of the change, whether it is in healthcare, whether it is in education, whether it is in, you know, sort of like figuring out service delivery from, from the government side um, and, and so on. Okay, before I have uh, Barku go in, I wanna just add something to that. Um, I mean, those are great agendas, agenda items you mentioned, and we have Charity Wanchiku, who is a powerhouse in the solar space in Kenya, and she said, in Kenya, our big four agenda includes food security, manufacturing, affordable housing, and affordable healthcare for all. What I want to add to that, and I think it does cut across all of the, the different sectors you mentioned and, and how we need to advance moving forward, is we really need to make it easier for people to start businesses. Um, it's, you know, it's such a difficult, and you know, I mean, you worked in this space, so you understand this, but, but it's so difficult for someone to start a business like legitimately. And, you know, we, cause we haven't even talked about the fact that we still are dealing with unemployment and unemployment is even worse, right? The unit of unemployment. And so we really need to be able to invest in self people being self-employed and then small businesses that can employ others. That is really, really, really critical uh, because if we don't do that, uh, you know, this is even going to get worse and definitely investing in innovation because this is the time when we innovate, right? This is when we come up with the new things that can help us. So Barku, if you want to just go ahead and, and, and just chime in at this point. Um, my, 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 my positive, uh, I, I am aligned and totally agree with everything that you guys mentioned because I do think that, that people will be, governments and businesses will be very strategic and, and focused on, you know, new ways to succeed. Um, I think that's a plus. I think one of the things for me that's a real positive, Kelly, to your question is I think moms and women will now have an opportunity to enter, re-enter the workforces because um, I think there's, you know, it's now proven that you don't necessarily have to go to work. You know, I think we're going to see a lot, you know, physically be in the workspace. I think we're going to see mothers, you know, regaining their time, um, you know, that I think is really, I think that's going to be really special. I think, um, you know, I, I think one of the things that there's so many amazing, you know, I, we call them quarantine ideas that are coming up and, 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 and now your businesses are, you know, future proof strategies for your business. Um, and a lot of it is very, you know, is, is, is based on a lot of technology. Uh, but I think how we approach business and how we approach um, growth, development, education, all of these things will now have to be really strategic. I think that's the positive because I think it will force um, you know, some third world countries to really focus, refocus uh, their agendas and what their poverty reduction strategies, you know, are, are looking like because they need to be prepared or we hope it does prepare for this. But I think in terms of positives for me right now, um, I love what I think it's going to do to the workforce, especially for women. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of amazing women who usually have to sit back. And I love that, you know, in terms of a short term thing that makes me smile. Uh, that is something that I think that, you know, is, it will be really good to 
get women back in the wor- workforce. I think one of the things that was really funny is um, I, I, I always say now because we have to spend so much time, this is total sidebar. Now that we have to spend so much time at home, it's going to even make us decide how we choose our spouses. Because, you know, <laughs> Yet. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so sorry. No, I, I always like low humor, but I think that that's um. <laughs> Arthur, you you said the truth. You got to. Okay. I'm gonna hug to you. Me, you but I'm just saying. I just think it's funny. No, I'm not I'm gonna, just... I'm gonna hug. We're gonna hug. We're gonna hug afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So what? What? All right. So Amini, do you want to jump in, or sir, can I go ahead and just? No, 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 I'm good. I'm going to tee up some others. Um, so one of the things that was also brought up is, let me just see. Um, so Mike from Kenya, he brought up the point, and I think this is important, is also we're going to need to invest in mental health. Do you know how many people are traumatized through this? Um, Barku, you were on the Ebola committee, or I guess it was a council um, in Liberia. What, it, you know, what kind of mental health issues came out of that or like what kind of trauma? you know, you also came out of a war, like came out of that, because I think that we have so many people who are traumatized, not just in Africa, but everywhere, um, who are going to, we're going to expect to be able to be productive and to be able to reintegrate into the world. But, you know, having gone through something so tra- traumatizing, I mean, I watched a funeral on, on, a, on, a, on Zoom <laughs> two weeks ago, like, you know, I can't even unsee that, you know, a casket, but go ahead, Barbara. Um, I think, you know, Ebola was a little different because you actually could still move around. I mean, I never thought there would be a day where I would say, you know, I take Ebola over anything. But, you know, that day has actually come. Um, I think the big thing was the stigma during Ebola. It was the big thing was the stigma. And and I think there is stigma uh, related to COVID-19 as well. But I think with this, there's a lot more. Um, People are having to navigate life in a completely different way and have no idea because nobody really has been through this, right? So, you know, even your therapist, if you have one, they've never experienced this, you know? So it's, I think it, it is very challenging. And I think there has to be mechanisms and ways that people find that works for them in, ter- in terms of a self-care and mental care. And I think the most important thing, and I have a friend, if you guys can, uh, she has silence called Silence the Shame. Her name is Shanti Das. And oh, I think one of the I, I, things I that- I was Shanti. Did you really? I was undergrad with Shanti. <laughs> no way. Okay, she's yeah. a great friend of mine. But yeah. um, she has a, 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 a an organization, an initiative called Silence the Shame, which is one of the big things I think in the global black community is we don't own our mental health issues. You know, usually it's witchcraft. Usually it's something's wrong with this child. Yeah. Usually, you know, depression is a real thing. And I think one of the first things that need to happen is we need to own it and we need to acknowledge it and then we need to work on it um, and know that you should not be ashamed of whatever your feelings are. People go through things in different ways and um, there's no right or wrong way to tell somebody how to deal with a specific situation. You're stuck at home with three-year-old triplets, you know, so. Um, <laughs> Real. <laughs> so I think mental health, I think that's a very valid point that was just raised. And I really hope, you know, because I can tell you in Liberia, we have very limited anything that speaks to mental health there you know i have a friend who tries her best um you know there's there's really no support there as at, at, at all really you have international organizations that come but there's really not, there's not a therapist i don't even know of a therapist really a licensed therapist in liberia and you know you can go to your churches but i think mental health certainly because aside from covid-19 people had issues before this so you know, it's just it's just like a huge chunk of. And in fact, I think uh, uh, Amini, can you please add that as your six in your <laughs> your top five? I think you need a plus one because I plus actually one. I actually think that that's probably one of the yeah, most no, important true. things. You know, and another I think that's very another, valid. Another really important book is Black Sh- um, Black Pain. Um, that was that's Terry. Oh gosh, what is Terry's last? I have to look up Terry. You know Terry? She was in PR. She used to be uh, Eddie Murphy's partner. Yeah. Terry, uh, what did you say? Is it Mike Millen? No, no, not Mike Millen. Uh, oh. Not more, but I'm going to have to look it up. But Black Pain is a really, really, really good book. That's a very important book. Go ahead. Mark, we can't hear you. Unmute yourself. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. I, I, I actually know her and I can't her name. Now I'm going to search in my phone because I have her Terry thing. Williams. But don't let me hold you up. Yes, that's her. Williams, Terry Williams. That's a great, that's her. great book. And yes. it's 
Yeah, that's a, that's a really important book. Um, it's the first one I saw on this topic and I read it and I met her and I talked to her about it and it was amazing. So absolutely we need to address this issue. Um, okay, let me see. We're, we've gone over, so I want to just make sure. I'm here, but I want to make sure everyone's cognizant of that. I want to be cognizant of your schedules, but I could talk forever with you. Um, let's see what else we can see right here. Um, let me let me see if we can go ahead. And we talked about COVID-19. Uh, we talked a little bit about, uh, okay, this is something, this is now, this is where we talked about all the fun stuff, right? Or the stuff that, that, that just shows how awesome you are, but it's really important. We also talk about some of the struggles we have as entrepreneurs, as leaders, because I think for some of the, the folks who are on here, I have, a, I, I, believe it or not, um, every month I'm teaching 200, 750 entrepreneurs through e Cornell's program. Um, these are women who are all over the world who are um, starting um, their businesses. And, and so, you know, one of the challenges is for them to be able to see someone who looks like themselves because that 60% of them are women, are black women, 80% of them are of color. But I want them to understand that, you know, they, they're they going through, you're going through, you've gone through challenges, you've overcome through challenge, overcome challenges. So let's talk a little bit about that, you know, so I want to, you know, I know that you, Barku, you're a serial entrepreneur, you've had several um, uh, endeavors. Um, Amini, you've turned around organizations, you've run a lot of different organizations, um, and so have you um, in camp, and I myself, I've started two businesses as well as uh, turned around a nonprofit organization and advised lots of little lots of organizations and, and businesses. And one of the things that we often don't hear about is the backstory, right? I remember being on a panel with a guy named Omuigi. Oh God, I can't say it. he's a he's a he's only he's the only African VC funder in Silicon Valley. He's Nigerian and he says, I'm a I'm a, an overnight success 20 years in the making, right? Because nobody knows about the 20 years that it took for him to get to that stage to be that guy. So I want you to share a little bit about, you know, what are some of the challenges you had starting your organization or growing your organization and how you've overcome them? Like what are some 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 ways that you you've kind of demonstrate your demonstrated your resiliency because it's real. There are obstacles and there are lots of them. Yeah, maybe I'll go first. Um, sure. So I, mean, I, I love that, you know, 20 years overnight success, 20 years in the making. For me, I sort of, you know, count like 10, 15 years. Um, so soon, soon it will be 20 as well, um, you know, because people only see who you are today. Um, you know, they don't really see all the hard work and, and, and the, the, the extra hours, the sacrifices that you've made to actually get to where you are, you know. Um, and, you know, especially sort of, you know, starting a technology company in Nigeria. And I started 12 years ago um, where people, you know, so the reason why I started was because I, you know, I studied in Germany. I came back to Nigeria and, you know, I would want to go and eat out and I would go on Google Italian restaurant in Lagos, zero results found. And I'm like, this cannot be, this is ridiculous. Right? I can't find anything. And the only way that you could find stuff was by asking your friends, right? So you would then, you know, sort of send a message to your friends and be like, hey, where can I go and eat out? And they will be like, okay, there are like five places you can go. These are the five places. Um, so I wanted to change that. And, you know, I started talking to business owners and, you know, saying like, okay, let me build your website. Let me get you on the map so that, you know, you can be found. Um, and I mean, like the amount of people that sort of were like, yeah, yeah, yeah okay. Um, you know, I remember there was one older man who was like, young girl, I've been making money since before you were born. Um, what is this website of yours going to do for me? <laughs> and, you know, like, I mean, to me that, like, I, I, I was so shocked at this question that I didn't have really have an answer. And I was just like, well, it's just going to put you on the map. And I mean, today the answer would have been very different, um, you know, because I obviously much more experience, much more confidence and, you know, those type of things don't. Um, shake me anymore but you know at that time I was just like am I doing the right thing is this the right path will Nigeria ever adopt technology will businesses ever really want websites you know um, but I, I decided that you know what the rest of the world is doing this stuff um, and, and, and I don't think that it will be any different here and you know so I then decided to just change the way that I approached it and be, I did more of awareness than of selling right um, and, and I think that today that is still my approach where, you know, especially, um, you know, just sort of doing a lot of trainings um, for C-level executives, for board members, for business owners to show them the power of technology. When you see the power of technology and you see what it's done for other businesses and you see 
what it could do for you, then, you know, you're sold immediately. So I think, you know, sort of just knowing that we're behind the curve at all times, right? Um, so there was a time I, I used to work with um, a development team out of India simply because we didn't have enough local talent and local developers that could produce the quality of what I wanted, you know. And then, you know, when I tell them like, oh, don't do it like this, do it like that, they're like, but this is like old technology. I say, I know, but you know, in Nigeria, our internet is slow. So it, this other technology won't load, um, you know, and, and that means that you're, even though you want to do cutting edge work, you are actually sort of forced by the market to, you know, um, you know, be a little bit behind. But I think that that's something that is significantly changing now. And, you know, we're seeing, you know, technology coming out of Africa, um, you know, and, and especially markets like Nigeria, Kenya, um, you know, South Africa, that is actually more advanced than te technology anywhere else in the world, and especially in the fintech um, and payment space, you know, and for me, this is so exciting, you know, as an entrepreneur, just to see that we are now leading in something. And, and what I've realized is that once you figure out how people get paid, that enables a whole new level of business, right? And and once that happens, then you know people adopt technology because they know they need the technology to you know push their products out more. They know they need digital marketing to push their products out more. So it's like an absolutely amazing time now, and I'm you know super excited. Um, you know, a lot of people have had sort of like the roughest couple of weeks. We've had sort of like our best month in. Uh, in a long time, you know, um, and and I and I think that that's also a result of sort of being resilient and and keeping at it and keep you know just pushing and just taking it one step at a time and understanding that it is a journey. It's not something that happens overnight. Um, and I think you know for for young entrepreneurs that are out there and even old entrepreneurs, um, because I think the journey never ends. Um, you know, but my advice would be surround yourself with people who are on the same journey, um, because that really really helps. Just being able to say, hey, this is what I'm dealing with, and you know, then they'll be like, oh yeah, let me tell you about my own problems. <laughs> then your problems will seem small, um, you know, and. And, you know, just being able to exchange, um, you know, your your troubles because people who are in paid employment simply will not really get it because they haven't gone through the things that you've gone through, you know. Um, and what has helped me as well is sort of reading a lot of um, autobiographies and biographies of entrepreneurs, you know. So one of my favorites is Shoe Dog, um, the Nike story. Um, you know, I mean, Phil Knight, amazing. To me, it was just like, this poor man was broke for like 20 years <laughs> until he IPO'd and he was constantly like on the verge of bankruptcy and on the verge of like giving up and on the verge of everything collapsing, um, you know, and that's, you know, because you only see the results, right? From when I was a kid, Nike has always had big stores. They've always had, you know, like everybody buys them. The shoes are expensive. It's, it, you know, especially as a child growing up in Africa, it was always like a, so I went to a German school and, you know, like there were a lot of kids from diplomats and, you know, um, expatriates and, you know, they all could afford these things. And, you know, we were just like, mom, can we have a pair of Nike? She's like, no, these other shoes are okay. <laughs> Why do you need this shoe that has this line? It's no different, right? Um, you know, so, so it was always that thing that, you know, we would sort of dream of having and it was always larger than life. And, you know, just to know the struggles that he went through to actually achieve that you know, that I read that book last year and, you know, it just, I just felt like, and Cam, you know, you really have nothing to complain about. Just keep pushing. And, you know, one day you will see those big results and you will see, you know, the, the manifestation of all the hard work that you sort of put, put in, you know, and I think that is really for me, the key message to entrepreneurs who are, you know, um, working at pushing their dreams and, you know, having a hard time sometimes is part of it. And being broke as part of it and you know not knowing um <laughs> everybody's nodding you know and not knowing um you know whether you're gonna make it um till next year is part of it right um but i think hard work um and you know pushing yourself and and, and resilience and being excellent at what you do are are keys to success there's thank you for that that was excellent and one thing that you mentioned is you, i think you've heard the saying your network is your net 
is equal to your net worth. Um, and so of tribe, your tribe is very, very important, the people you surround yourself with. So for those of you who are joining us remotely, please look at who's in the conversation and connect with them on LinkedIn or YouTube or whatever it may be and connect with us because we are all part of each other's tribe and we should be working together because clearly we are aligned around this vision or else you wouldn't be listening to us right now. So just wanted to put that in. Anyone else want to answer this before I ask the next question? Sure, I do. I, 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 I you know, I, I, I hate to say this just because, you know, it, it ages me, but I've actually been an entrepreneur for about 20 years. And I, and I will say, and I will say, you know, you're right. And Kim, it, it's a, it's a journey. My, my description of what motherhood is, it's the hardest job you'll ever love. And entrepreneurship has to be the same thing because it's not for the faint at heart. It is super hard. You have to be passionate about what you want to do. You have to be open to change. You have to be flexible. You, I mean, you have to be willing to get kicked in the gut so many times before you even land. And I can tell you, I, I, I feel like I'm still getting kicked in the gut, you know, you know, so, um, but you have to believe. And, and it's so funny. I'm listening to you and Kim talk about, you know, you know, your smiles are different than all of ours right now because technology is it. Like, you know, this is your time. So, you know, every, everybody has their time and this is, this is great, but you have to understand that, you know, not the reason many people, one of the reasons many people don't survive, you know, as entrepreneurs is because they just can't stomach what it takes to become an entrepreneur. And, and, you know, similar to your situation and Kim is when I, when I, started doing work in Liberia and, you know, doing events and branding and marketing and, and things that were just like, why? Like we're coming out of, we're just, you know, getting back to a peaceful uh, uh, setting. We're just trying to figure it out. What the hell are you talking about? I, I realized that I actually had to educate my consumers, my potential clients, because they had, they, they thought they, they knew they wanted it, but didn't really understand the value of why they wouldn't even need to pay me, you know, for it. So I think I spent about 10 years educating potential clients to now where I can actually say, no, you know, uh, uh, you, this is, I know my worth. I know what I've actually done for this industry in this whole country. And I know what I bring to the table. I mean, I think one of the, the gifts that I have is my network. Um, it's not just Liberia. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's global. I've gone to international schools. I've worked in entertainment. I've worked with governments. You know, I've worked with, you know, Nobel Peace, you know, laureates, uh, multinationals, corporate America. And I think that now, you know, you have to you have to be willing to go through those lessons, take the punches and all while being responsible, you know, all while being doing good, which is the new thing I learned, by the way, Liz can tell you guys that I was like, what is that? <laughs> doing well, doing good. <laughs> so but I but I think that. um you know, I think my, my, my thing in terms of being an entrepreneur is understanding the challenges that come and the resilient ones will come out of this time right now stronger than before, because you will be able to retreat, get more creative and be able to create more solid strategies and agendas for your businesses and your brands. Agreed. Amini, you want to go ahead or? Yeah, let me just, let me just, I think everything that's been like, said. Amin's like got like 25 points. <laughs> uh, <laughs> everything that's been said, I completely agree with. Um, please allow me to add these quick, um, this, just these quick ideas. So I was just thinking about uh, recession proof, pandemic proof businesses. Um, one, you know, understanding your competitive advantage, like what value do you add? Uh, when we ran the, the restaurant, um, I, I had, I, I, we hired this consultant and, and he said to us, he asked me, he said, you know, if you were to close today, what would people miss? What is it, mm. about, what is it that you're offering that is different from other people? So we happen to have offered really amazing crepes, like, our crepes were the best in the city. There's, you can't, you could not go anywhere in the city and get better crepes than ours. It was in our batter. My husband created this amazing batter with a secret sauce and people came for the crepes. So really understanding what is your competitive advantage? What value do you add? There's a, there's a nonprofit that I ran. I won't mention the name, but when I joined, 
I said, why should this organization exist? I asked that to the board. Of course, they all looked at me like, we're going to need to fire her. How could she ask us such a question? <laughs> <laughs> How dare she? Of course we need to exist, but why? I wasn't trying to be flippant. I was asking a serious question because in answering that question earnestly, then we're able to then do the next thing, which is offer who we are to our people. Right. So understanding your value, understanding your competitive advantage is critical and really asking the question, if we were to go under, what would be missing in, 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 in the market? If, if the answer is nothing, then, you know, why are you around? But if the answer is, oh, people will not get those great crepes or people will not be educated because we've been, you know, whatever the answer is, ask that question. So that's one. The second thing is recession proofing or pandemic proofing your business, relationships, relationship, relationships. Relationship, I mean, we can just turn that around every which, which way. Relationships, relationship. We're all surviving on relationships. We all are. It's the relationship that you built before this awful thing came on that you're relying on to build bigger relationship, you know, deeper relations. I've deepened my relationship with people that I, di I didn't even, I couldn't even imagine, right? And this has happened. Uh, the other thing is cash is king. When we ran the restaurant, I wish I knew this intellectually, and then I went through the process, but I actually learned it after, afterwards. Cash is really king. Hold on to it, save it, plan for it. Cash is everything. The last thing I'll say um, on this is um, two, two things. Flexibility, we're using innovation a lot. I, sometimes I like the word, sometimes I don't. But I think flexibility is is a is an underutilized word. So we, there are companies that no longer exist that were amazing. That Polaroid, um, Kodak, yeah. they weren't. It wasn't that they weren't innovative. They were innovative. They weren't flexible. Okay. Flexibility, being able to just you know change yourself into whatever it is you need to change yourself into. Lack of flexibility breaks a business. Then yeah. the last thing I'll say, which is kind of help, harkens back to Phil Knight and you know and 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 all that went on with Nike, is we actually need we need mentors, we need advisors, we need networks, but we need people that look like us that tell their story so that we can know that we can do it too. We need African focused business case studies. And authors. And authors, <laughs> right? So, that we, we, so, so anyway, so that's, that's, that's my take on that. Thank you. Absolutely, this is so amazing. I when I wanted, I'm so glad people are still with us, and that, ladies, I'm so glad that you're still with with me here as well. And I could talk forever, but let me just let me just see if I can get some questions um, handled here. So Debo says he loves it. Debo Florencia, who is our partner on this through Society for Africans in the Diaspora, he says um, he loves everything we're talking about with the agenda, the five 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 um, agenda items, and what he's saying is, but who's going to step up and champion these? these particular issues, right? Who is actually gonna be the one? Is it you, Amini? Is it I? Like, who is gonna be the person who's gonna say, I'm stepping up to do this or which organization? Do you have any idea about what you'd say to that? That's one thing. Um, and I, Clemencia, who is like my most most faithful outside of Seco and, and Woody um, of, of my participants, Clemencia, who's also in Kenya, and she works for an organization called Brook International. She wants to know what, what the role of the civil society is in, in what we're going through and coming out of this, right? So how, do we, how does civil society help us to rebound, which I already told you is really being impacted significantly at this point. So I think you can speak to that a little bit. Amini? I think, I think civil society can actually, they play a really important role in the five things that I mentioned. You know, they, many of them are already in these, in these sectors, you know, the, the water and sanitation sectors, 
um, the infrastructure, energy, healthcare, education. I mean, I think civil society is that additional layer, you know, above the citizens. The citizens have to hold, we have to hold each other accountable. We have to hold our governments accountable. We have to hold the private sector accountable. But the civil society is a really an, an, a very important layer because they collectively, with a lot of strength and a lot of oomph, can hold whoever needs to take care of these five things and, and the fifth, the sixth thing, health, you know, health, mental health. Um, are they doing it right? Are they, are they inclusive? You know, um, I, I, I put on my Facebook page, you know, when COVID started, Singapore apparently, you know, was a model in how you handle a pandemic. But you know what they did? They excluded the one point, I don't know, how many million immigrant workers that tend to be, you know, low income. They excluded them from the, their, their pandemic management. And COVID-19 really took over that community. And so their numbers was, were really skewed. They only took care of the wealthy and those who lived in the city. They forgot about all the people who make Singapore actually work. And so civil society has an opportunity to then say, hey, you can't do that. You have to be inclusive in everything that you do. You can't exclude people. So civil society, I think, is can, has, can, and will continue to play an important role in everything that we're talking about here. Okay, so thank you. So I'm gonna have, we need to wrap up because I know that, that we're now at 1.30, right? We're on this like CP time in reverse, but um, <laughs> what I want you to ladies think about while I'm actually kind of shouting out to some folks who join us, I want you to think about like what's one thing that you wanna leave everyone with and then how can they join? How how can they connect with you? And 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 you know, just something that you want to leave them with to inspire them. I know, Mina, you're gonna have 55 points. <laughs> just kidding. Okay, so let's see. So I want to say shout out to Caroline Thomas, uh, Lavette Arms, who's one of my students at Cornell, Shagun Olajungu, who who actually was I met him at the African Leadership Academy. He was one of the architects of their entrepreneurial entrepreneurship program. So. Nice to see you, Bahia Yasmin Robinson. So that's my girl, Bahia, who um, is has worked quite extensively in Africa. She's currently in the Silicon Valley, and she's in the she's actually in the investment space and and, um, and impact investment space. So I think Dr. Brown, who is interested in that, uh, that's someone you might want to connect with, Bahia Robinson. Festus Amoy, who's someone who found me on online. So nice to see you, Festus. Uh, Mutia, uh, Mutia is one of my Cornell students. Uh, Liz, we already said hello to you. Um, and then let's see who else we've got here. Um, I want to say hi to Cheryl Stedman, who's my girl from New Jersey. Um, and then I also want to say something to say hello to uh, Sophia Adengo, um, who is my girl in Uganda. Uh, she's actually um, been in the media business. She used to be in, 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 Liber in um, Nigeria, um, in Chem. And let's see if we've got a final, if anyone else has something they want to mention. I think that something, the point that Woody brought up that I think is important, we kind of skirted on, is that, you know, right now, uh, everyone's looking for answers, or people always look for answers to crises from the West, right? Or they're coming, looking from the US and so on and so forth. But the answers right now, in my opinion, are either coming from Asia or specifically in Africa, right? So um, Barku used to sit on the um, Ebola, um, I guess, advisory committee in Liberia. And so folks who had the grapple with that, who've dealt with a lot of real challenges, like in the DRC, you've had Ebola there, in Uganda, we've had it. Um, countries that have had to deal with this type of stuff, they understand, you know, how to immediately, you know, kind of um, make sure that the, popu the population is, is, is ready um, and that they're practicing um, preventative measures, right? Because it's really important to have the preventative measures and not just focus on the after, right? Because that's where the the pharma companies make money, but really the preventative stuff is where we help to make sure that people are safe. So I just want to make sure that I mentioned that point that um, we absolutely do have folks on the continent who understand how to address this. And in fact, we do have solutions that are coming out of out of Senegal. They're also coming out of Madagascar. So if anyone wants to quickly talk about that before we go ahead and have you wrap up with your words of wisdom, please jump in. Or who is ready? She ready. <laughs> uh, she ready. Um, no, I, I'm just, I, I, I definitely think I'm so impressed with Senegal. Um, 
so impressed with Senegal and, and I just, you know, saw something where the, I think the minister of information or, or the government spokesperson was challenging the WHO, you know, because of, um, you know, their thoughts on the serum that they have. I think, uh, you know, I think we should start looking within. I think there's a lot more that we have to offer. I, I mean, Madam Sirleaf, president, former president of Liberia, president Sirleaf has been speaking a lot on, uh, lessons we can learn, um, from, you know, during Ebola to now. And I, interestingly enough, I will say this, I would think that countries like Liberia um, or a country like Liberia who, you know, experienced, you know, you know a, a tremendous amount of the effect of Ebola, um, and also we were the first to, to be Ebola free, uh, women leadership. <laughs> um, but interestingly enough, Ebola was very different, but what I find that is a little disturbing is we should have a better idea to be able to move faster in terms of a consorted uh, effort to combat or to manage uh, the pandemic. But sometimes we, we don't utilize our existing resources, people who have had the experiences. We, you know, we, we tend to want to go elsewhere. I mean, that's our issues with, I think, African leadership sometimes. It, you know, it's, it's always like you have to change the guards. And because of that, there's a lot of things that, you know, sort of get left. So we do have a lot of information. We do have, you know, more experience than, than others. But the question is, are we using that? And I think when we can start to really, because there are some Liberians who, who championed how Liberia succeeded, um, you know, the, the Ebola virus and being getting to, you know, Ebola free, um, and they're working in other places. You know, they're not working, they're not working in Liberia. So, um, you know, so I, 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 I agree. I think, you know, the minute I heard about Senegal, I actually texted our minister of information who actually tested positive and thank God he was just, you know, sent home. So he's, he's now doing well, thank God. But I was like, you guys need to reach out to them. They're right here. So we, we need to work, you know, I, I mean, I'm, I'm not, I have to do more homework in terms of what's happening with the ECOWAS and the Mono River Unions and, you know, and, 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 and the African Union in terms of, you know, a collective approach. I've been on some calls in terms of a, a, a larger, like what's happening in certain industries, but, you know, how we can support each other, I think would be really important. So. Um, I think we do need to, you know, finally, I'll just say, yes, we do have the expertise. Uh, we do have the know-how. This is very different. So people, even in these countries, are responding differently because in a, during Ebola, people were dropping dead. Now you're, you're, you're asymptomatic and you're perfectly fine, but you're contagious. So it's a, people are responding differently. And we should look into what we have because we probably have more than we need from outside if we can manage it properly. I agree, one hundred percent, absolutely. So, are you ready with your words of wisdom? Before I get, go ahead and let set you up. I want to say hi to Chrissy Lockhart, and I want to say hi to my friend Constance Derricks, who is joining us from the south. Uh, thanks for joining us. And then we've got um, uh, who wants to go first? Who wants to give their words of wisdom or wrap up comments first? And Cam, you want to go? Okay, I'll go first. Um, so, so I think that. For me, we have what I've sort of, I guess, learned over the years is that we are the ones, right? So we keep waiting for somebody to do it and somebody to lead it and somebody to change it and somebody to sort of take charge, you know. Um, but we are the people who are going to lead that change. We are the ones that are going to actually um, make that change, you know. So I think that we should not be afraid of stepping into responsibility, stepping into leadership positions, and, you know, sort of just getting in the driver's seat and driving. And I think the easiest way of doing that is sort of just understanding that, you know, if, if every single action you take has an impact and will make, even if it's just one life better, right um then you you've already won right so so i think my message is be that change that you want to see you know um and and just stop talking because i think across the continent there's just too much talking going on um and too much sort of looking at other countries outside of the continent um like oh america is so great oh europe is so great oh you know but at the end of the day the solutions that work there will not work for us, right? And, you know, I mean, you know, 
the lockdown failing in Nigeria, um, you know, it just shows you that we cannot lock down because we don't have the social structures. We don't have, you know, um, our, our systems are not set up the same way, right? The fact that we now have so many kids out of school, you know, how do we solve those problems? Those problems we have to address in a very, very different way, you know? So I think all of us have to, you know, collectively come together and start solving these problems and using the positions that we are in, you know, whether you sit on a board of a big company that can do something, or, you know, you sit in a government committee and you have a voice, or you have a friend who's a minister, you know, you have to use that power, you have to use that network to make that impact and to keep pushing that impact and to keep pushing that change. You need to use, you know, your, if you, if you do speaking engagements, your speaking engagements to talk about these issues and, and raise solutions as well, if you have solutions, you know. So I think that that really is my message, that we are the ones and we need to be the change that we want to see. Yeah, I agree, definitely. Okay, uh, Amini? Um, hi. Oh, this is great. I wanna uh, pick up on, in Kem's, um, just uh, what she said there, because I completely agree um, I, I was writing as she was talking and I was nodding in agreement. I wrote down no copying, no pasting. We, 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 we got to stop doing that as, as, as Africans um, for, 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 for the problems that we face. Um, we need to stop copying and pasting. We need to observe. We need to learn. And then we need to figure out how we can solve these problems within our own context. And I think, again, this pandemic has shown that. So I just want to support that because I think it's 100% true. But then I'll just say, I'll, I'll close with, um, with these four things. We need to keep learning. We need to keep connecting. I want to write a book that's, that's titled Love, an Economic Development Story. Because I think at the core of our challenges on the continent, I'll speak to the continent specifically because that's where our, all of our roots are. That's where, you know, I think I can say that all, our hearts are there. Um, we, love is an action verb. When you love something, you take care of it. If you love someone, you take care of him or her. If you love yourself, you take care of yourself. If you love a company, you do everything that you can to make sure that company is moving forward. If you love a country, you act. You do things to foster that country's development. So I think we've been we've been using, we've been saying that we care about the continent, we've been saying that we we love it, but we're not acting like it, and therefore it can't be true. When you love something, you foster its development. That's the true definition of love. You foster its development. So if we love the continent, if we love our respective countries or our adopted country, like in my case, Liberia, Congo, I love, I love Liberia, I love Congo, I love Senegal, I'm married to a Senegalese, you know. So if I love those places, then I need to, to foster their development. So love is an action verb. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Marku, bring it home. Uh, I don't know how I can, but I have to say I'm gonna I'm gonna piggyback off the love statement. I um I'm it's gonna true. piggyback off the love statement and I and, and I'm gonna um first of all say thank you to you, Liz, um, before I, I, I bring it home. And I wanna say it's such an incredible pleasure connecting with you two ladies and uh uh Amani and, and Kim I, I and Liz. Um I hope we do connect to love on these countries and, and some of these young people in, 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 in these countries, you know, post this call. I'm going to task us with that and, and make sure that, you know, we're not one of those platforms that once we get off, even if we're going to impact the lives of maybe five people, one in your country, one in my country, one in whatever. So we can say through this connection, you know, there was a transformation in somebody's lives, really simple things that we can do. But I, my, my parting words is love on yourself. Right now, I want you to love on yourself. I want you to stay sane. And I want you to not put any type of 
ridiculous expectations on yourself. Stop going on Instagram and 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 may, thinking life is so perfect. You know, um, even during the midst of this time, I really want to encourage everybody to take each day and each minute minute by minute it is okay not to be okay right now yeah. and when you are not okay find what makes you feel better in the moment take five minutes read your bible say your prayer meditate you know whatever it is that you know get away from your kids if you can um you know for five minutes lock them in the bathroom i don't care i mean you know <laughs> this is coming for you Oh, I got to go back to Liberia. There's no diapers there. But I don't have to do that. But I'm just saying, you know, find what makes you happy. And the, the, the one thing I really want to say is, you know, homeschooling is tough for everybody. And, you know, if you miss a day, so what? If you miss a day, so what? So love on you minute by minute and find the thing that, that, that drives you for your purpose, impact, and gives you the results that make you happy. And that's it. Wow. Okay. I, I mean, I feel like this was a TED Talk times 20, you know? Uh, thank you so much. And Cam, Amini, and Barku, this was awesome. This is, I'm so glad I chose you. I'm so glad you joined me. I'm so glad the technology worked. <laughs> Um, and I'm so grateful to everybody who's able to join us. Thank you so much. Um, my friend Cheryl wants to figure out how folks in the diaspora can get engaged as well. So Cheryl, you need to connect with all these three ladies. We're all on LinkedIn. We're on every channel. If you notice, we uh, beneath all of our images are our social media handles. So please connect with us that way as well. And let's figure out how we can work together because the point of me doing this, you know, the reason why I decided, like, you know, I, I was trying to do something, right? And I said, the end of the, the, the of, of March, I was like, how can I give something? I'm not rich. I'm not some like really wealthy person. But one thing I can do is I know how to talk. I know, <laughs> I know people. <laughs> I have a lot to say. So let me see if I can help people to kind of help people to think about um, things differently, how they can access resources, how they can access now, new networks and so on and so forth. So this is the love that I'm trying to put out there in the world. And so thank you to the three of you for, for helping me to put my love out there in this way. Um, and everyone, please get in touch with us. Um, I'm going to say a little promo. Um, obviously, you need to join Barku's uh, Boss Lady, um, uh, Boss Ladies on Thursdays. And I actually watched. She had on the minute the the vice president of Liberia, who's a, a woman. I just might want to mention that, and she was really cool. <laughs> so um, you definitely want to definitely want to watch that. Um, I'm going to be back on next Tuesday. Um, I'm going to have on um, next Tuesday. I'm part of eCornell's keynote series. And so they're going to have me speaking about personal branding, which is and helping you to really brand yourself during these times because there are a lot of people who've lost their jobs or they're thinking about maybe starting a business and so on and so forth. And so how do you brand, and not just in a very superficial way, but really leveraging your skill sets and demonstrating how you can give value to whomever. So that's coming up. That's a free session. It's Tuesday. It's not a regular Wednesday session that I usually do and it's on their platform. I've already created an event invite. I'll drop the link in the um, comment section. So please join me and share it and spread and ask questions. But thank you to everybody for joining us and um, just be safe. Uh, continue to social to to socially iso socially iso what's the word? Socially yeah social, social physical distancing. Physical distancing but don't socially I don't don't be isolate. Don't isolate yes. yourself. Gosh, I can't even do it. Um, and so, uh, so yeah, Sh uh, Cheryl tells me that she's already linked into all of you. And thanks for Mike. Thanks for Chinwe. Oh, Chinwe Eguim said thank you to you and Cam. So I think that's someone. I feel like that's a Nigerian name, definitely. Right. <laughs> uh, and everyone, ladies, I want you to stay on. I'm going to end the broadcast now. But um, thank you to all of you for joining us. And if, ladies, if you want to drop anything in the comments section for folks to to connect with you, please go ahead and do it on the on the YouTube, which is on your computer. And then on, on LinkedIn, you can do it on your phones if you're doing that. Thanks. Okay, bye everybody, be safe.